are you people doing? And I said, well, we're just, I'm just, mom's just translating. What the hell are you playing? What's going on? And, I, and we said, well, we're just trying to uh, learn about the Helen Creighton songs. He said, Jesus Christ, I thought um, I was dead because Helen had gone and recorded f songs that we play all night long and sing in Mi'kmaq when people are waked in our homes for four <laughs> days and four nights. So it was a lesson learned, as I heard earlier, a lesson learned. Even when they're recorded, you really should do your homework and your research before. So, um, so I also come from the longest line of great storytellers as well as trap, trap line. I, my family um, on both sides were trappers and hunters and they also found gold in many places. Um, so a lot of our stories were told to my grandparents and my parents around a little tiny fire in camps all over this territory that was lit by um, moose fat in a little cup with a little tallow or a little wick. And so a little fire would be lit in the camp and this is how my dad learned from his grandfather. And they used to ro walk a hundred miles in, on the trap lines from Lansdowne down to Tatamagush over across to Belmouth. So I grew up with trap line stories and I know a lot of you know the glue cap stories because Silas T. Rand wrote them down from somebody. But that's not what we're all about and, and, and it kind of has, when you write down these stories, you, we get stuck in time. And, there's this great amount of material that you don't know about. My favorite ones come from my dad and my Uncle Kenny because they were really wonderful storytellers and wonderful people. Um, they used to tell me trap line stories. And uh, I'm going to try to get through a couple. Because it's, a, it's their stories of resistance and resilience in, in, in face of all adversity. <clears throat> for 250 years after the British signed a peace and friendship treaty with us, they denied it. They didn't honor it. Yet our, in our oral history, the old people would say, we have the right to hunt and fish and gather, just don't get caught by the RCMP. <laughs> or the game wardens, because they were the ones that were, af were in charge of us, besides the Indian agent. The Indian agent was also... Um, <clears throat> Uh, given the task on each reserve to make sure that no, none of our language was spoken at the schools. And my Uncle Kenny said, I said, do you remember being in day schools? And that's the big issue right now. And he said, I remember every minute of every day of every hour. And I said, what, why? He said, repeat, every morning, he said, we go, we have cod liver oil, unpasteurized milk, and raw eggs. And that's the first thing we had to do. We had to have that. Then... The teacher would take out her agenda and say, everybody, so I want everyone to pretend you're in the school. Every day for eight years, because we only went up to eighth grade on the reserves, you had to say this. Now repeat after me. Indian is no good. Ready? Indian is no good. I will not speak Indian. I will not speak Indian. So our children in day school were told to do this every morning, and at the, end, at the end of the day, they'd say, remember, ready? Indian is no good. I will not speak Indian. And if you were caught, because the teachers would give little kids candy in the playgrounds, if they would come and tell on anyone that was speaking in the playgrounds. So of course, my Uncle Kenny and my dad they would get visited by the game, not the game warden, the RCMP and the uh, super, the uh, Indian agent saying, Mr. Martin, we hear you're speaking language in the house and you have to stop it or we have to fine you or put you in jail. And my, my grandfather was the only person that brought the food. See, we had to hunt and fish during the night because we couldn't get caught, even though we had the treaty that said we ha were allowed to. So when you think of people being raised like this, telling you your, who you are and your language is no good, the language from your mother, from the heartbeat. 
and also that you have the right to hunt and fish and, and gather, but don't get caught. Like, how do you live for 250 years in a society with that message? Anyway, that's, that's what I want to talk about, but their resilience, as, as always, uh, I've always been in awe about it. So they were great hunters. My great, great, great grandfather was well known as one of the greatest um, guides in all of Nova Scotia, Peter Joe Cope. And um, so there's lots of stories. But one of them was Kenny and, and Dad were young boys. And every day they had to find food. Every day. And that's not 200 years ago. This is just, you know, they were raised in the 40s and the 50s. So the game warden shows up, which they're always ready for. They know he's coming. And um, he comes and he says... Um, I, uh, he, he came in the camp, he said, I understand, you know, you guys been hunting. And they didn't say anything. They just stood there and he said, you know, I'm going to have to check around in your camp and see where, you're, where, you're, where things are. Just want to see if you're hunting. Okay. And um, Michael Kenny says, oh, geez, oh, mister, oh, sir, let me, you, he dropped his hat. Let me get your hat. So he went down. And he, and he came, here you go, sir. And my dad was like, after he left, Kenny, what the hell were you doing giving, getting that, oh, that RCMP's hat for him? He says, because I hid the gun under the table. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one trick. And another time he was, um, they were outside, out hunting, and my dad was down a bit, and Kenny was up here, and the game warden came, and, they, and, and my dad said, run, run. And Kenny stood there, and they went down to see my dad to see if he had fishing rods or, or a gun or anything. And, um, and uh, Kenny was just sort of up above, just throwing things in the water. And my dad said, Kenny, why didn't you come down and help me? He said, because I was throwing all of the, the empty shells in the water. He looked like he was just, you know, chucking stones. Because they were such famous guides, one of them, Char P uh, old Peter Wilmot, he used to tell the weather, and he was always recorded in the Halifax Herald for the weather, and he, he helped with the Farmer's Almanac. I'm going to grab one more minute of this. And, um, and old Peter Wilmot... Um, my Uncle Kenny said, you know, he said, you know, old Peter Wilmot, he um, told the weather every day, and he, he was the last of the Indians, and the old people call ourselves Indians because that's what they were told they were. Um, the old, in, old Indian, he used to live in the campground, in the, in the woods, and the moose would tell him, speak to him about the weather. So he would come and he would tell Halifax Herald about the weather. He would lie down with the moose and the moose would say, have a, have a sleep, um, Peter. It's okay, just lay down. But he started getting so old that um, he had to come and live with his son, Charlie. And Charlie was a really good friend of um, the guy that flew the plane. Who's he? Lindbergh. And, and he used to be down in New York, running the trains, um, the transit. And Lindbergh and him were good friends. So he brought Lindbergh up a couple times hunting. And he said to Lindbergh one day, Lindbergh kept saying, you know, I'm going to fly across the Atlantic. No. Yeah, I will. And he said, okay, well, when you do, he said, would you tip, tip your wings over Millbrook so that, you know, we can all see you before you go? He said, sure enough. So one day, sure enough, and the old man, Peter Wilmot, was living in the bar, in the shed because he got out of the woods, but he couldn't live in the house, so he lived in the shed. So it, sure enough, Lindbergh took on his flight across the Atlantic. He came up. He went, over, uh, he went to go over Millbrook, but old Peter Wilmot was all crippled up like this. And he said, how am I going to see this. They said, oh, we'll bring you out. So they hauled the old man out into the field near Brookfield, and Peter Wilmot was like this. So when they put him down on the ground, he was still like this. He said, well, I can't see anything because his head was this. So they quickly dug a hole, and they put a long piece of wood over the hole, and they f flipped him up so his legs were up on the hood so he could see. And sure enough, 
Lindbergh came across, flew right over, tipped his wings, and he went on across the Atlantic. So those are, that's just one of the many, 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 many stories that nobody knows about. And it's part of our history, and it's part of this land. So I just shared a couple. Hey? They do now. Yeah, they do. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go. <laughs>